Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Lord Jesus, we love you. Amen. We give our whole lives to you. Amen. We give this morning to you. Amen. Lord, we want to see you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, last night was uh, message one. And um, we saw that the general subject of our conference this weekend is on the book of Acts. And we want to see the continuation of Christ. And message one was on the intrinsic significance of the book of Acts. And our brother Sam shared with us, I I appreciate it again, freshly seeing that uh, today we need to be in Acts chapter 29. Of course, we know the book of Acts has... Uh, 28 chapters, but actually, when you see, the books of, book of Acts never ends, Amen. and today we are the continuation of Christ, Amen. right? So we need to be today in Acts chapter 29, and we can be in Acts chapter 29 because we are the Lord's witnesses. You know, a witness is someone that has seen something. They are eyewitnesses. That's, that's who we are. We are witnesses of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. He's not just some historical figure. He's living in us. And we are his continuation. And uh, the, the way we can be his continuation uh, is by seeing him. Witnesses, they see him. They've seen something. You know, we were singing, this the vision of the ages. You know, that's what, that's what this whole meeting is about right now. You know, maybe you were singing that. You didn't know what, what that was about. We're going to get into this matter, uh, which the, our brother, the Apostle Paul, talks about in Acts chapter 26, verse 19. He says to King Agrippa, Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. The heavenly vision is the vision of the ages. Uh, the Bible is a marvelous book. There's a lot of things in the Bible. But throughout the Bible... From Genesis to Revelation, there is a vision. There is a central vision. And this vision is the vision of the ages. And this is why we're at this conference. This is why we became a Christian. This is why we're breathing right now for the vision of the ages. Even this is why we come to the Bible, not for minor things, but actually, Lord, what is the central vision? In the Bible, there is a heavenly vision. And, um, and I, ju- I just pray. I remember Brother Sam, he, sh- he shared last night, uh, Ephesians 1.17. And I just really pray that for myself and for all of us right now. It says that the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit. O oh Lord, my spirit may give to you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the full knowledge of Him. So we want this this meeting to be a seeing meeting. We would see something. We don't want to just be here, but we want to see. We don't want to just hear, but we want to see. Oh, we're here and we're, we're listening. But as we're listening, we're praying. And as we're praying, the light is shining and we're seeing something. We're seeing the heavenly vision of God's eternal economy. This is marvelous. Okay. Let's read uh, the title for message two. It says, The Heavenly Vision and Vanquishing Conversion of the Apostle Paul. And let's go through uh, Roman 1. Let's read this together. And then we'll develop this more. Roman 1. While Saul of Tarsus was on the way to Damascus, a heavenly vision came to him. And this vision revolutionized him. After he saw the vision, he became blind, unable to see anything, and impotent unable to do anything. A blessed blindness comes upon those who are met by the heavenly vision. The inner vision will increase more and more and will revolutionize the way we serve the Lord. This vision will control us to do everything by the Spirit, in our spirit, and in the body, through the body, and for the body. For three days, Saul did not see anything. And he did not eat or drink anything. All he could do was pray. It is likely that as Saul was praying, vision after vision and revelation after revelation came to him concerning Christ as the embodiment of God, the mystery of God, 
and the church as the body of Christ, the mystery of Christ. Each crucial point of Paul's vision recorded in Acts 9 should not merely be a teaching to us, but a vision that we see on the heavenly, quote, television. In our reading of Acts 9, we need to see the heavenly vision concerning three items. Let's say those items together. Me, Jesus, and chosen vessel. Amen. Well, you know, like I shared, there, there's a vision. There's a governing vision throughout the Bible. Uh, and the title here, it says, the, the heavenly vision and the vanquishing conversion of the Apostle Paul. And may, maybe we've never heard this before, vision. Uh, what is a vision? You know, it, rest assured, this is not something uh, spooky. Uh, it's not something strange. Oh, I saw a vision. Um, this is very normal. Actually, every Christian needs to see a vision. I mentioned before, uh, Acts 26, 19. Paul says, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Actually, the Old, the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, there's a similar verse. Uh, in Proverbs 29, 18, it says, where there is no vision, the people cast off restraint. And we just need to pray right, pray right now, Lord, oh, I, I wouldn't be one of those that would cast off restraint. Lord, I would be one that has a vision. Every Christian needs a vision. This is what the whole Bible is for. The Bible is open to us to impart a vision. So what is a vision? What are, what are we talking about? What do we mean by vision? So a vision is an extraordinary scenery, right? You just, you look, oh, I just look out. Well, we need to see with our spirit an extraordinary scenery of God's eternal economy. Uh, so, you know, a vision is something, it includes revelation, light, and sight. That's the, that's the vision. Revelation, light, and sight. You know, I, I was thinking as we were singing, you know, I was looking at some of these brothers. They've been to our, our flat recently, right? And uh, we live up on the fourth floor. And you have a pretty good view of all of, all of Kingston, actually. Um, when you look out to the left, you can see Bushy Park. Um, you can see Kingston Town Center. Uh, you can see the planes flying back and forth to Heathrow Airport. Just a marvelous scenery, right? It's just, it's just a wonderful view. Uh, in fact, recently one of the brothers, he says, actually, over there you can see uh, the Kingston Uni Library. It's like, wow, I didn't, I didn't see that before. There's just, a, you know, a, there's just a scenery. When you're in an uplifted, elevated, taken to a high mountain, you can see an extraordinary scenery. That's what we need to see in the Bible, right? We don't come to the Bible just for knowledge. We come for an extraordinary scenery. You know, but if you, if you come to our flat and, you, and I want to show you this, this scenery of Kingston upon Thames, you can see the river, all the parks, the university, you know, really beautiful. But what if I said, you know, come in here and I had the curtain drawn, you know? You couldn't see anything, right? Because that's what a vision is. A vision, a vision is, starts with revelation. Re revelation from the Bible, right? This vision comes from the Word of God. And uh, that's why we, pray. we need to pray for a spirit of wisdom and revelation, right? And Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3.16, whenever the heart turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away, right? So we need, we need to roll back the curtain, you know? But also, if I say, look, look at this scenery here uh, of Kingston upon Thames, um, but actually it's a cloudy day. There's no light, right? You can't really see much either. So we need these two things. We need to pray. We need to be desperate. We need to have a pure heart before the Lord. What do we say? Lord, I turn my heart to you. We need to come to his word where there's a revelation. In this word, there's a revelation concerning his heart's desire, the heavenly vision of his economy. But what do we need on our part? We need to turn our heart to the Lord. All the veils will be rolled away. Oh, any other thing covering our heart will be rolled away. And we need to pray, Lord, shine on me. Even right now as I'm talking, and soon we're going to get into the word. You need to pray, Lord, shine on me. Shine on your word. I don't want to be here in a routine way. Lord, there is a vision. Lord, Paul saw this. I must see this. Amen. Amen. And uh, this vision uh, that Paul saw was a vanquishing vision. And um, let, me, let me illustrate this. You four brothers, come up here. One, two, three, four. You two, come up here. That's what's good about being in person, right? Yeah, we can have these illustrations. 
for more for more scenery because we need to see right so um so brother you're you're the apostle paul uh actually i should say you are saul in acts chapter 9 verse 1 it says and saul breathing out threatening and murder all right and you brothers you are your disciples you're the followers of the lord jesus you're over here you're over here and 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 you know Saul, he didn't start out with a heavenly vision, right? We know that, right? He started out as a persecutor, the top persecutor of those with the vision of the Christians. And how did he know where the Christians were and who the Christians were? By calling on the name of the Lord, right? So you brothers, you're, you're, you're real lovers of the Lord Jesus. So what do you do? You call, start calling, brothers. Oh, Lord Jesus. They're calling. And you're Saul of Tarsus. There they are. I... I, now I have permission. I'm going to go arrest them. Go arrest them. Go arrest them. Get them. He says, I want to throw them in prison. But what happened? What happened to Saul of Tarsus? He was on the way to arrest the believers. And then a light from heaven came down upon him, brighter than the sun, right? And that was the Lord appearing to him. And he said, who are you, Lord? And then he eventually said, what shall I do, Lord? So actually with, the, with, the, with Saul of Tarsus, uh, the day he was saved was the day, at the same time, he saw the heavenly vision of God's economy, right? Maybe some of us have been uh, saved already. We've already been a Christian for many years, but we haven't seen the heavenly vision yet. But we just pray, oh, Lord, I want to see this vision. What Saul experienced on the road to Damascus, every Christian must experience. You know, uh, you may say, well, he's the Apostle Paul, uh, and I'm, it's just me, you know? But no, no, actually every Christian must have a heavenly vision. And so what, what happened to Saul? He, he received the Lord. He was actually going to arrest the believers, and he received, it's, we'll get into it more later, but he received the Lord Jesus. And then what happens? He, he comes in contact with a brother, Ananias. You're Ananias, and you're Saul. And the Lord tells Ananias, you know, in a vision, there's a man, Saul, you know, in, in uh, he's just received it. And now, Ananias, you need to baptize Saul. And so, Saul, the, the way he found the Christians, is because they were those calling on the name of the Lord. But now the Lord tells Saul, you need to be baptized, calling on the Lord's name. So now you baptize him. <laughs> baptize him. Put him down in the water. He's baptized. Right. And now, I want to see this, that Paul, he's not just converted He's not just becoming a Christian. He has a heavenly vision of God's economy. And this heavenly vision, it, you could say it ruins him. In the word of the outline, it vanquishes him. That means he's thoroughly defeated. You know, he was going one way. Now his life is in a totally different direction. You know, as Christians, we, we cannot be halfway. I think we all know that. It's, it's, Lord, I'm just not satisfied being lukewarm, being halfway, only seeing a little bit. Lord, I must be absolute for you. Lord, I must see the vision of your economy. And uh, so, so Saul, he, he saw a vanquishing vision, which just revolutionized him. And he, in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, verse 14, he says, thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph. And this, you know, actually what he was referring to is, uh, is uh, the Roman generals. At that time, the Roman generals, when they went out to war, to battle, they would, uh, they would defeat, you know, some of the tribes, and they would take them back to the capital city of Rome, and they would probably parade through the, those, those big arches, right? And they are now the captives. And, but actually, Saul used that in a, in a positive sense. He says, now I'm a captive. You know, Saul, you were, you were once part of Satan's kingdom. Now you belong to Christ. You are a captive of Christ. Okay, so now you're Jesus. And you're all, you're all the captives. And actually, you know, you would think to be a captive is not so good. But actually, we were once captives of Satan. Now, we've been thoroughly defeated by the Lord Jesus. We belong to him. So now you're, you're, you're general Lord Jesus, right? And you're, you're the believers. This, this is our experience. And then now what do you do? How do you feel about being a captive? You say, praise the Lord. Praise the Brothers, Lord. praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I belong to the Lord. So the Lord Jesus, right, uh, he is our captain. And he's, he's defeated us. He's vanquished us. We completely belong to him in every way. All right, brothers, thanks. Okay. 
Okay, so now, now, you know, I mentioned before that this, this vision, it comes to a revelation in the Word, in the Word of God. So we, we, need, to, we need to see where this is in, uh, in the book of Acts. So let's go to Acts chapter 9, and let's read verses 1 to 19. And I, you know, I just really feel like our reading of the Word, I really feel like this is the burden of the message. You know, I, we t- we really, our, the, the whole point of being in this meeting right now is we want our hearts turned to the Lord and see a heavenly vision of God's eternal economy. And this will come through the shining of the word. So we just need to pray right now. Lord, speak to me. Shine on me. Show me the vision. All right, let's read this all together. Acts chapter 9. But Saul, still breathing, threatening, and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him, Damascus, for the synagogue, so that if he found any who were of the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And as he went, he drew near to Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell on the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you persecute. But rise up and enter into the city, and it will be told to you what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. And Saul rose from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And they led him by the hand, and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without seeing, and he neither ate nor drank. And there was a certain disciple in Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise up and go to the lane called Straight, and seek in the house of Judas a man from Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and laying his hands on him so that he may receive his sight. But Ananias answered, I have heard from many concerning this man how many evil things he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call upon your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for this man is a chosen vessel to me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer on behalf of my name. And Ananias went away and entered into the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Saul, brother, the Lord has sent me, Jesus, who appeared to you on the road on which you were coming, so that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately he received his sight and rose up and was baptized. And once he had taken food, he was strengthened. And he was with the disciples for some days. Amen. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call you brothers up again. And maybe again another time too. Let's get ready. Get your, all right, open up your Bibles now. Uh, we're going to go through these verses together. All right, so, so we all should have Acts chapter 9 open. And, um, you know, I, I just hope we see that uh, the Lord... Of heaven, he spoke to Saul of Tarsus, a gospel message. And I think what we saw here in reading, it was very short, but it was complete and full, and it was vanquishing. It it completely defeated him. It gained him. It conquered him. It revolutionized him. His whole life was different. Not only did he believe in the Lord Jesus, but he saw a heavenly vision of God's economy. And this heavenly vision of God's economy, it revolutionized him. It strengthened him. It empowered him. He w- it was everything to him. Uh, it wasn't just that, oh, I, I saw a light, and now I'll, I'll go back to my own living. 
No, this, this vision completely changes us. So actually, as we read the word, uh, we just pray, Lord, speak to me. And uh, now we just like to open the word. We like to have an unveiling right now. And uh, we want to see what Saul of Tarsus saw. Because actually what he saw in his vision must be our vision. So we must be desperate before the Lord. Lord, I must see. I must see the heavenly vision of God's economy. Amen. So, what? It, this is just marvelous. Um, what the Lord... The gospel that the Lord spoke to Saul was just three words. And, and this is on uh, Roman numeral 1 point D. Let's say these three words together. Me, Jesus, and chosen vessel. All right. Now you brothers, you're going to open up Acts 9.4, and you have Acts 9.5, you have Acts 9.15, and you have Acts 26.19. All right. And now brothers, start with Acts 9.4. Read Acts 9.4. Amen. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So Saul felt, he fell on the ground. What did the voice say? What was the first thing the voice said? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Well, who is, who is Saul of Tarsus? Right? He's a... Pharisee of Pharisees, he's there. Uh, you could say he had a vision, right? But it wasn't a heavenly vision. His vision was, I'm serving uh, the God of the Old Testament, Jehovah. And uh, these Christians, um, these followers uh, of Jesus, uh, they're, they're just spreading heresy. And I must do whatever I can to stop this, right? But the voice says to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Right? So Saul, as it says in uh, verse 1, Saul, still breathing, threatening, and murder against the disciples of the Lord. This was in his being. His whole being was to stop the Jesus followers. But then the voice says to him, why are you persecuting me? Let's just say that together. Why are you persecuting me? This, 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 I mean, when Saul heard this, he must have been astounded. Why is the voice saying me? And actually, I would you know, call your attention. Look, look in your Bible. This is a capital me. This is a capital me. Saul, why are you persecuting me? You know, Saul would say, I did it. And the next he says, who are you? Who are you, Lord? So the Lord was talking to him. And uh, if Saul, 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 in Saul's estimation, he would say, I'm just merely arresting the followers of this man, Jesus, right? But he never realized, wow, why are you persecuting me? That means the God in the heavens I'm actually persecuting here on earth. That means that these believers, these Christians, are one with the God, in, the God that I thought I was serving in the heavens. Wow, what a revelation. Wow. So actually, we must be the Lord's continuation, right? He's just not God in heaven and we're down here. Actually, what are Christians? What are the believers? You could say, we are me. We are me. The capital M-E. What is this? This is a corporate me. This is not just Jesus, a man uh, who was just spreading some teaching, and then he was crucified, and then, oh, we thought we, we've done away with him. No. What does this mean? Oh, this means this Jesus. He was crucified, but he was resurrected. Now he's the Lord of all. And he must be living in his believers, in his followers. And actually, Saul realized, when I was persecuting these Christians, I was persecuting the Lord Jesus. What, what is the implication of this? This is because if I persecute the Christians, I'm persecuting the head. You know, if I, if I Michael, right? Yeah. If I, if I just, you know, if I hit Michael, you know, I'm not going to hit you too hard. But you wouldn't say, uh, why, why are you persecuting my arm? You wouldn't say that. You say, don't, don't hit my arm. Stop hitting my arm. You say, stop hitting me. Me. Because the body is one with the head. The body and the head are one. So what is this me? This me is a corporate me. This is the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus is the head, but he's also the body. 
He's the Lord enthroned in the heavens, but he's also living in his believers. Amen. Oh, I hope we would see this. Amen. There is a corporate me. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Wow. Oh, Saul was revolutionized by this. This is the body of Christ. Amen. This had a deep impression on Paul. You know, uh, Paul was the only writer in the New Testament to use the term the body of Christ. And even, even that song we sing, what is the church in Ephesians 1.23? the fullness of the one, right? This, this is, this is the, the body right here. We're, right, what are we? We are the body. What am I looking at? I'm looking at Jesus right now. Amen. This is Jesus. Amen. Jesus is in you. Amen. I'm looking at the body. Amen. Christ is the head, and he's also the body. Amen. Wow, what a revelation. This is what our whole lives are for. Our whole lives are for the corporate me. Amen. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Actually, that me, this has so much implication. These words, me, Jesus, vessel. You know, when Paul was just considering these words, actually, these three words, all of his 14 epistles come out of these three words. And this, these three words are the heavenly vision of God's eternal economy. Me, Jesus, and vessel. What is God's eternal economy? It's to have me. No, not me as an individual, no, not, not me, not the lowercase me, but he wants me, the corporate me, the body of Christ. Christ the head and Christ the body. Okay, Joseph, you go with uh, Acts 9.5. Wow. I mean, can you imagine? Here Saul of Tarsus is, you know, this Jewish man, and he's persecuting the Christians. And he thought Jesus was someone that died. Why are these guys still still following Jesus? This guy is dead. But he says, you know, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus. Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus. Saul of Tarsus, he's, he's crying out to God in the heavens. Lord, who are you? Lord, what do you mean I'm persecuting you? Lord, who are you? Oh, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus. Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus. Lord, who are you? I am Jesus. Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. I hope we see, oh, I hope we see this. What a revelation. Oh, you know, we we just call all the time, Lord Jesus. But do you realize that Jesus is Lord? Jesus is Lord. This Jesus, and who is Jesus? Oh, the name Jesus is, is uh, Yeshua, right? Yeshua, right? This, that, means, that means Jehovah, our Savior, the salvation of Jehovah. What a revelation to Saul. And what a revelation this must be to us. This God in the heavens is now living in his believers. And his name is Jesus. And he's the Lord of all. I, Saul, Saul of Tarsus, he would say, well, I thought I was just, I thought... Uh, Jesus had nothing to do with God. Actually, who is Jesus? Jesus is God. Jesus is the very God incarnate. Jesus is I am. Jesus is God becoming a man. And and the fact that, you know, this voice said, he said, who are you, Lord? And I am Jesus. Lord Jesus, if, if you're up there, but then you were down here, but then you're God, that means God became a man. That means he actually lived on the earth. That means he, and if he's up there, that means he was crucified. But he didn't just stay in the tomb. That means he was resurrected. And he's poured out as the life-giving spirit. And he's living in his believers. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah for the corporate me. Hallelujah for Jesus the Lord. Wow. So what is this? This is God's heart's desire. Christ and the church. Uh, Christ as the mystery of God. Who is God? And that's exactly what Saul said. Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus. The mystery of God is Christ. But what what is Jesus? Is is he just Jesus alone? No, he's enlarged. He he now has a body. Christ is mysterious. Have you seen Christ? Well, I'm seeing Christ right now. Praise the Lord. Oh, I'm looking at Christ right now. I'm looking at Jesus. I'm looking at Jesus' continuation right now. 
I'm looking, I see a corporate me. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. You know, Stephen said, I see the Son of Man. I see the heavens open. Well, I see the Lord Jesus right now. Amen. Here he is. Amen. He's living again. Amen. What does this mean? Jehovah God, right? He stepped out of eternity into time. He became a man, right? He was, he was born in a manger. We know he lived a human living. That means he must have been crucified. He died. He had an a all-inclusive death, right? And, he, and he, had a, he resurrected. And now he's ascended as the Lord of all. He's the Lord Jesus. And he's living in his believers. And his believers are his body. And his, this body is spreading all over the earth as his continuation. Okay, but how do we experience this, right? Uh, how can we be in this vision, right? So what's the third word? Zach, what's the third word? It's vessel. All right, you read it to us. Acts 9, 15. But the Lord said to him, Go, Amen. this man is a chosen vessel to me, to bear my name before both the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. Amen. This man is a chosen vessel. Wow. Me, Jesus, vessel. Me, Jesus, vessel. Say it. Me, Me Jesus, Jesus, vessel. Right? So, wow, we just realized this. Wow, that this Lord Jesus, he has a body. And how does he gain this body? Through vessels. Open vessels. How, is, how, how, does, how, how did the Lord continue in Michael and in Zach? Because you were an open vessel. And the Lord came into you. And now he's spreading. He's increasing. He has a continuation. So what do we do every day as Christians? We're just open vessels. Open vessels to receive him. Praise the Lord. And so all of this, me, Jesus, and vessel, you add those together, that equals Acts 26, 19. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. That's the heavenly vision of God's economy. Me, Jesus, and vessel. Thank you, brothers. Praise the Lord. Wow. So this... As again, like we were singing, I'm just a reminder, this is the vision of the ages. And I just hope we would, I hope we have a praying spirit right now. Oh, Lord Jesus, I'm a vessel. Oh, you know, I got a, I got a, I got a vessel here. This is a vessel uh, right here to be filled with water. This is also a vessel here. Man was made in the image of God as a vessel for the triune God to come into man, to be expressed in humanity. And, uh, and, and, and not only so, but he desires to have a body, the body of Christ. So we just realize, what, what, is, what are our lives for? Our lives are for me, Jesus, and vessel, for God's eternal economy. What, and how do we carry this out? Every day, we open our hearts. We turn our hearts to the Lord. Lord, fill me with yourself today. L- fill me, Lord Jesus. You're the Lord Jesus. You're the Lord of all. Lord, fill me for your body. Fill me for me, the corporate me, that you could be enlarged. And actually, this is what our whole lives are for. This is what we're breathing for. This is why you're in university. This is why you came to to university to see a heavenly vision. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Now, I just just appreciate so much what kind of effect... Uh, this this vision can have on us. You know, um, Saul, you know, he was breathing out murder against the disciples. You could say in one way, he was just a devil man. He was just breathing out murder. But the Lord appeared to him, and he fully captured him. He fully vanquished him. And then he became a vision man, right? And this, this is how we need to be. We need to be a vision man, someone with a governing and controlling vision of God's eternal economy. Lord, for the rest of my life, I don't want to be the same. Lord, I like to live for your purpose. Right? We need to realize that God has a need. God has a purpose. The whole Bible is unveiling his purpose. And he's unveiling his heart to us. Lord, oh, what mercy. Lord, thank you that your word is open to me, that I could see me, Jesus, and vessel, that I could give my whole life to you, to to be filled with you every day, that you could have your continuation, that you could have your body built up, your bride prepared. You could have a way to come back. This just, this just changes everything. So after this conference, oh, I just pray you would be revolutionized. You wouldn't be the same. 
that doesn't mean you drop out of uni. You still go back to uni. But you're there at uni, and you are not the same. You are there part of the me. You're part of the living body of Christ as a vessel filled with the Lord Jesus. And you, you are his living witness to speak him because you've seen him. You love him. You live for him. Praise the Lord. Oh, just, you know, just, it's amazing. Uh, Saul, he wanted to, to imprison the believers. And then I appreciate it later in Acts 15, 25 and 26, talking about uh, Barnabas and Paul, it says, men who risk their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. You know, maybe we despise the Lord Jesus. Maybe we didn't care so much for him. Lord, make me one that would even risk my life. What is that? Even my soul life. Lord, I give my whole life to you. Lord, it's not precious to me. Lord, I give my life to you. And I just want to share also um, Paul's uh, experience of being with the church in Ephesus. This is in Acts chapter 20. He was with the church in Ephesus for three years. And I was considering, you know, most university degrees, they're three years long. So what a pattern for us. How should we be in uni, right? What a pattern. Oh, Acts 20.20 20 says, I did not withhold any of those things that are profitable by not declaring them to you and by not teaching you publicly and from house to house. Oh, when you're, in, there, you're there in university, you're not there in a routine way, in a casual, you're there under a vision of God's economy, right? You're not withholding anything from the ones around you. You're there house to house, right? Uh, he says in verse 27, I did not shrink from declaring to you all the counsel of God, right? Every day we need to see the Lord Jesus, be filled with him. And we just speak to the ones around us what we see. You know, you're not there as a preacher. Uh, you're not there just passing on some secondhand information, but you are speaking concerning the one you've seen. The Lord Jesus is real to you. He is real. He's living in you. And you just, we just desire that he would be real to all the ones around us. Oh, I just appreciate Acts 20, 24. It says, but I consider my life of no account as if precious to myself in order that I may finish my course and the ministry which I have received from the Lord Jesus to solemnly testify to you the gospel of the grace of God. You know, what? we, we, we should even say this, Lord, because of the heavenly vision of your economy, because of seeing your heart's desire, I consider my life of no account as if precious to myself. What does that mean? I'm not living for myself. I'm, just, I'm, not, I'm not living uh, uh, just to make a name for myself. You know, I, I was thinking um, at Kingston University, you walk in, there's a lot of pictures of, you know, this one graduated here. They all get, oh, they get a plaque, you know. Wow, there's somebody. They're, they're in the Hall of Fame at Kingston University. Actually, we're, we're not trying to seek worldly glory in that way, right? I consider my life of no account right? I'm not living here for anything else other than Christ and the body of Christ. That's what my whole life is for. And my time at university is just to love the Lord Jesus, just to be filled with him, just to be with the saints house to house for the carrying out of God's eternal economy. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. And um, wow, brothers and sisters, this vision, oh, you know, I just, I tell you, you know, for me, you know, growing up, um, in a, uh, you know, in the denomination where I was, I never heard this. You know, I was a Christian for about eight, nine years, and I never heard anything con concerning a heavenly vision of God's eternal economy. I never heard anything about the Lord Jesus filling me, about the body of Christ. But you know what? When I came to university, I met the saints. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I met me. Amen. I met the corporate me. Amen. Right? A lot of people say, oh, I'm going to university to, uh, you know, for me, right? For me, myself. But actually, we're in university for me, the corporate me, Amen. the body of Christ, Amen. the enlarged me, Amen. the continuation of Christ. Oh, I just tell you, I just thank the Lord so much for his mercy on me. You know, I my life was going in one direction, and it was just for me, for me, myself, and I. Oh, Lord, I just thank you so much for your mercy that I could live not for myself. Appreciate in Philippians uh, 2.20, uh, 21, uh, Paul says, uh, Timothy was like sold with him, right? He cared for God's economy. But he said about the, you know, he said, all seek their own things, not the things of Christ Jesus. 
oh, I just thank the Lord so much for his mercy. That coming to university, I could see that God has a heart's desire. He has an economy. And you know what? This is, this is what we're here for at this conference. So I just, oh, I just pray for, I just pray that you would pray. I just pray that you would turn your heart. You know what? Our whole lives are for the triune God and for his heart's desire. And you know what? For the carrying out of his purpose. But you know what? He, can, he only does this, as Sam shared last night, through a body of his witnesses. You know, if we don't know the Lord, if we don't see him, how can he carry out his economy? How can he build up his body? If we don't know he has a body and we are a member of the body and we need to be filled, filled in with and for the body, how can he gain this in reality, right? Is it merely just a teaching to us? Is it just something left in the Bible? Oh, we don't want it to remain this way. Lord, you have to speak to me. You have to reveal to me. You know, uh, it, it's even the same with our salvation. You know, I, I can't get saved for Zach. You know, I can't, I can't pray for you to receive the Lord. Just in the same way, I can't pray for you to see, receive a heavenly vision of God's eternal economy. I can pray for you, but I can't see the vision for you. I, we pray for all of you that you would see something. But you, we all need to go to the Lord. Right? And, that, and that's the last thing I want to share, is that, is that to have this vision, this vision requires prayer. Uh, what, and that, that was the case with, um, with Saul. In Acts 9.11, it says, And the Lord said to him, Rise up and go to the lane called Straight, and seek in the house of Judas a man from Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. For behold, he is praying. So what, what is Saul's reaction? He gets... He sees this marvelous scenery, me, Jesus, and vessel. He sees a heavenly vision. And I think that's, that's really meeting by meeting in this conference. We're just having an unveiling of God's heart's desire. But really, what is our reaction? What is our response? Oh, that was good. Uh, I think there was some good teaching on Acts chapter 9. Oh, no, we, should, we shouldn't be that way. We should be aggressive. Even the, so even the song we sang, aggressive, uh, bold, to press on, to consummate God's goal, right? We need to be bold. We need to be aggressive. Lord, I come to you. Lord, I'm desperate. Lord, I come to you in prayer. Lord, I won't let this go. Lord, you appear to uh, Saul. You appear to many of the members of your body. Lord, you have to appear to me. I have to see what your heart's desire is. Otherwise, why am I a Christian? Why am I here? I don't want to be here in a halfway in a luke, lukewarm way. Lord, I have to see. And you know what? If we turn our heart to the Lord, I, I guarantee you, the Lord will be faithful to cause us to see. The light will shine. So this, you know, you, we're just here uh, at the conference. And I just hope right now we're praying. And, um, and after I'm done speaking, we'll have a time for sharing. And you can speak what you saw. You speak concerning the heavenly vision. But even later this afternoon, you know, we have a, you have a time maybe to study for recreation or sports. I just encourage all of us, um, just take some time. I don't even know how much time, however much time the Lord wants you to be with him. But I would say take some personal time to be with the Lord. Even first thing after lunch, just go to be with the Lord. Lord, just pray back what you hear. Open the word. Open Acts chapter 9. Lord, you have to speak to me. Lord, Lord, maybe I don't see it yet. Lord, but shine on me. I want to see your heart's desire. Amen. Don't you think if you pray this way, don't you think the Lord would want to open his heart to you? This is his heart's desire. This is what he's waiting for. He's just waiting for an opening in you. Oh, Lord Jesus. You know, um, and I appreciate uh, Acts 9.9. 9. It says, and he was three days without seeing, and he neither ate nor drank. You know, in a, sen in a sense, we're here three days, and actually we shouldn't eat or drink of anything else. Of course, we have the physical food, but actually all the other food, all the other food, we're taking a fast, right? Uh, what was Saul doing? He was just praying and fasting. And he was just three days. He had scales over his eyes. He, couldn't, he was blind. He couldn't do anything. He wasn't eating. What was he doing? He was just there praying. He was praying me. Jesus, vessel, me, Jesus, vessel, Lord Jesus, I am Jesus. He was just praying this, and this became a heavenly vision in him, 
that revolutionized his whole life. And actually, this, the completion of the Word of God, the New Testament ministry, everything flowed out of this, out of his prayer. So you know, I'm just, even, even as I'm just sharing right now, I'm just impressed. Thank you, Lord. Saul prayed. If Saul didn't pray, maybe we wouldn't have the 14 epistles. Lord, what about me? Lord, to be your continuation today, Lord, gain my prayer. Lord, gain my prayer every day. Amen. Oh, Lord Jesus. Amen. And, um, I, you know, I just say that this is what, again, this is what our lives are for. You know, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of young people today uh, giving themselves to a lot of things, um, a lot of different causes, um, you know, some, some good, co- you know, some human rights. There, I, I was following one situation, you know, we've heard in the news for many years, and just, I was just so impressed. These teenagers, uh, now, now they're young adults now, but for many years, uh, they gave their lives uh, for a certain cause, uh, um, for, a politi- for a political cause. They even risked their lives, you know, by the government. They've been, you know, they were tracked by the government, this and that. And uh, at the cost of their life, you know, they, they, they were falling. You could say they had a vision, you know. And um, I was just even, even impressed in some way, uh, you know, with the climate activists these days, you know. They re- you could say they really have, there's really a vision, you know. They're just, everything in their life is according to this, you know. And, but, uh, you know, even one, I think, uh, even one activist, she sailed in a boat from Europe to New York City and it was a zero emission boat. You know, she even risked her life. I was, I was quite surprised by that. You know, she even risked her life to go there, and, you know, in, in, because she had a vision, you know, of, of this uh, matter of climate change. But I just think, you know, Lord Jesus, there's so, there's so many young people today giving themselves to so many things. Lord, but what about your heart's desire? Lord, here we are. Oh, Lord, you brought us here to this conference. Lord Jesus, here we are. Oh, there's so many people that are, that are absolute for so many things. You know, that, that means, that means even, even our humanity, uh, we should be absolute for something. We should give ourselves to something. But what are you giving yourself for? You know, uh, if someone, someone asks you, what, you know, what are you doing? You say, I'm, I'm also an activist. I'm an activist. Okay, what, what are you an activist for? I, I'm, I'm, I'm an activist for God. I'm an activist for God. And I've seen God. And I'm here for God's heart's desire. You know, in, in another way, someone someone may say, "Well, what is your what is your cause? What, what is your cause? What are you what are you living for? What's your what's your world view?" And you say, "My cause is God. God is my cause. I do every I, I I'm I'm here. I'm a normal student, going to get a normal job someday, but my whole life is for God, and I'm here for God's heart's desire, and I have seen something of God's heart's desire, and this governs the way I live. You know." Even, even Paul said in Ephesians 3, for this cause, what it, this cause is the heavenly vision of God's eternal economy. He says, I, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you, the Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of the grace of God, which was given to me for you. What is that stewardship? That is God's eternal economy. What is our cause? There's so many causes going on today. People are absolute for so many different types of causes. Oh, but we have the top cause. We are the top activists. We're we're at university for the top cause. What's our cause? God's cause. We're speaking out on behalf of God. Even we're protesting on behalf of God. No one else is listening to God, caring for his heart's desire. We are for God. Why? Because we've seen him. We've seen something undeniable. I've seen God in the Bible. He's spoken to me. I've seen his heart's desire. And you know what? I can't unsee it. I've seen it and it's not going away. God's heart's desire is my heart's desire. This is what I live for. Amen. Oh, Lord Jesus. So again, I just say the, the, only, the only way to, to, to live this way, to have this kind of life. And you know what? This life is the most enjoyable life. I, I, I don't, I, I'm just kind of, I'm just trying to read, read you right now. If you're, a bit, if you're a bit nervous, oh, what does it mean to give my whole life to God? It is the most enjoyable life. Oh, what a life to give ourselves to the Lord Jesus. To, to, to be transferred, as Paul said, Lord, open my eyes, right, from the authority of darkness to God. 
I would be to God, for God. This is the, this is the most blessed human life, to give ourselves to God. Praise the Lord. Um, so I, uh, I think I should finish now, but um, I'd just like to finish with, um, with two verses. And these are two prayers of the Apostle Paul in Ephesians. Uh, the first is what I mentioned earlier. The first prayer is a prayer for revelation. And I just, you know, as you're with the Lord uh, this afternoon, you just pray to the Lord, me, Jesus, and vessel. And I'll give you two other verses. <clears throat> Ephesians 1, 17 and 18. This was the Apostle Paul's prayer for the church in, in Ephesus that they would have a revelation of the body of Christ, of God's heart's desire. He says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and revelation. He's praying that the Ephesians would have a revelation of God's heart's desire. The eyes, right? So this is a matter of seeing the heavenly vision. The eyes of our heart, having been enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. And then, and then finally, you know, as, as the Lord, as we just open to the Lord, we give ourselves, we have a, a revelation, and this actually becomes a vision to us, a governing vision. Uh, we need to take uh, Paul's second prayer to the church in Ephesus, a prayer for uh, the experience. And uh, verse Ephesians 3.16, he says, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his spirit into the inner man, that Christ may make his home in your hearts through faith. So I, I just pray for myself and pray for all of us that every day we would be poor in spirit, uh, we would see the revelation of God's heart's desire, and we would pray, Lord Jesus, make your home in my heart today. And actually, this is not just for me as an individual, but Lord, make your home in my heart for the body of Christ, for your heart's desire, that the heart's desire, uh, that your heart's desire could be fulfilled in this age and you could come back. Come back soon, Lord Jesus. Lord, so I'm a vessel here for you. I'm a vessel to be filled with the Lord Jesus for the corporate me. Me, Jesus, vessel, a vessel filled with the triune God, filled with the Lord Jesus for the corporate me, the body of Christ. Praise the Lord. So let's have some prayer now, and then we're going to have some sharing.